Greetings in the name of Jesus to you, Journey family, and everybody else who is watching or listening. Uh, in the name of Jesus, uh, just pray blessings on your life. And also, uh, we look forward to the reopening of Journey. It's coming. It's almost here. We are a little over a week away, July 5th. We are going to be reopening or regathering as a church. I mean, technically, we never close because, like, the Church of Jesus Christ never closes, right? It's not how we roll. But uh, we will be able to regather and be able to uh, worship the Lord in spirit and in truth uh, with one another and see one another again. So that's July 5th, obviously not this weekend, but uh, the next weekend we are going to be reopening. And so be looking for information on that. A lot of you have seen our stuff on the, on the Internet, on our website, on YouTube pertaining to reopening. Uh, we are also having a push for volunteers. Some of you have been asking about volunteerism, specifically for our clean team, responsible for sanitizing and doing cleaning to get our place spick and span so that we can safely host everybody and keep everybody safe from uh, the, any kind of uh, viral infection or anything like that. And then also our uh, greeters team or our welcoming team uh, which we are uh, recruiting for right now. Some of you have already uh, written in. You've seen that we have had we have a link to our website where you can sign up and indicate your interest in helping us out with that. So some great ministry opportunities there. Uh, please continue to read Journey Weekly as they have some links for uh, signups for volunteerism and then also information about the reservation system that we'll be using in order to get people in groups of 50 to come and join us for worship. Uh, but in any event, uh, any, any information that you need between Journey Weekly and uh, our Facebook page and YouTube, we're getting everything we got to you. If you have any questions or anything like that, please just email us, call us. Uh, a lot of you, you know, we're an open book, so uh, please be in touch. But we are looking forward to seeing you and we are looking forward to being together and working together for the sake of the Lord. So we are continuing uh, today, it's our last installment with a series that we have uh, implemented kind of abruptly. Uh, we, in we interrupted our Mark series. We're looking at the challenge of Jesus. And we watched as in the wake of the jo George Floyd murder, uh, our world erupted into protest, right? Just a few short weeks ago. It feels like this has been going on for forever. But just a few short weeks ago, our world erupted into protest. And not just the United States, but also the world over the murder of, jo of George Floyd at the hands of police officers. And um, we are still wrestling with all the implications of that. And so we thought it was appropriate to speak into this biblically, speak into this moment, interrupt our regularly scheduled programming, if you will, and to try to hear what the Lord is saying. There's so many voices that are vying for our attention right now, that are vying for our affection right now in the midst of this moment. And so we want to take some time out and hear the Lord's, the Lord's voice. And of course, there are many believers who are trying to gra grapple with all this uh, all around the world. Many different churches have talked to pastors, and, uh, and there's lots of people doing that right now, pressing into the Lord and trying to discern what the Lord is saying, because there are many voices that are not just speaking, but they're vying for your affection. They're vying for my affection. And there are many people speaking whole truth, half truth, quarter truth, a third truth. And we want to go, of course, to the truth. And so we are coming to... Christ Jesus, we're coming to the Word of God, and we want to see what the Lord has to say to be able to frame the moment that we're in right now. And when we started out, we, our series is called Being Disciples in an Activist World. We started out looking at Moses, who we're calling the second best activist in all of Scripture. And we, we talked about the, the need for there to be uh, credibility and authority in the midst of our activism. And we, are, we looked at how uh, both of those are needed in the midst of activism, in the midst of being uh, people who are going to be activated for a cause, particularly if we are standing with the oppressed, if we're standing with those who've been victims of racial injustice. We want to be people of credibility, and we want to be people who walk in authority as we're doing that. Last week, we, we, we went wide, took a wide-angle lens, and we talked about the America's sin wound of racism. And we, we followed biblical metaphors, or the biblical metaphor of sin as a wound. And we looked at how sin can be a, a deep and wide sore, spiritual sore, for a nation. As we looked in, at the Old Testament and how God used that metaphor to speak to Israel and to Judah. And how God uh, addressed Israel and how God addressed his own people's sin wound. And we looked specifically at that. We said that America, with respect to racism, 
has a deep and wide sin wound. It, it's deep and wide. It's like the Grand Canyon. And it, it is something that has uh, never adequately been addressed. We have made progress. We have. We have to name progress in, in, in America. In fact, uh, progress racially happened here, I think, at a speed that, that speaks to the fact that uh, America has got a, a uniqueness to it with respect to our ideals, our constitution, uh, our notion of what constitutes a republic. Uh, even though we have, for most of the life of our nation, lived in hypocrisy with respect to those ideals, especially as it comes to the issue of race, um, the, the, uh, the goodness of those ideals can be seen in the rapid nature in which we've made progress in this nation. We have made progress. I am a child of America's progress with respect to to race, and we need to name that just like uh, God had no problem naming Israel's progress in the midst of her deep sin with King Josiah, who we looked at last week, who was a king who was either the equal of David or maybe he had surpassed King David, which is the high watermark for kings. And we can name our progress the way that God named Israel's progress, but the problem, there's still a problem because God said that Josiah's progress, 31 years of awesomeness, from Josiah, 31 years of godliness, of equity, of justice, was not enough to deal with Israel's sin wound. And so Israel was still going to go into exile because you had this sin wound that had spanned generations. And then you had just one generation of godliness. And even though that one generation of godliness was amazing, it was not enough to be able to heal Israel's sin wound. It was too late. And we, we said that the gospel, there's, there's another sin wound that we looked at last week. We ended on Isaiah 53, and we looked at Jesus' woundedness for the sake of sin, the suffering servant who was bruised for our transgressions. And we said, that, that's, that's, the, the, that's the, the, the cosmic victim, Jesus, uh, who God had sent to deal with our sin wound. And, and he is more than adequate to do that. If we apply the gospel, if we apply the gospel to the sin wound, the gospel's only effective to the extent that it's applied. And that doesn't speak to any deficiency in God. That speaks to a question about our, our deficiency and our integrity. Will we bow before the Lord and receive the gospel, not only individually, but can we have a gospel impact in this world especially with respect to the church, because the church is the one institution that God has left here to make a gospel impact. We cannot expect people who do not love Jesus, even the best of people who do not love Jesus, to apply the gospel. It's not going to happen. It is on the church. And so this week we're going to delve a little bit into how how that can happen. And I, I just want to have a letdown just up front. Let me just get it out of the way. There is no one sermon anybody can preach that can deal with all this. It, you can hope that maybe, you know, preachers, teachers, whether you are have a platform like the one I'm occupying right now, whether it's, it's you in your home speaking to your kids and transforming the lives of your children, uh, whether it is a Sunday school teacher or just someone in, in, in the marketplace who's trying to bring the gospel to bear on his or her uh, position in the marketplace or maybe his or her position in a certain institution. There is not a kind of a one-stop shopping to be able to figure all this out. It, there really isn't. I, I wish there was. I think everybody wishes there was a silver bullet. And even with respect to Christ, how we apply the gospel is not one-stop shopping. Right? It is not a silver bullet bullet in the sense that, uh, that, that you, need, you need that one sermon, that one teaching. Um, that, that's not how things go, even though we wish that may be true. Uh, the gospel is more than sufficient to deal with uh, the inhumanity uh, of, of humankind and the godlessness of humankind, but the application thereof is the issue. And if that's the case, then the integrity of the church is in question, because we are the ones left down here. By, by God's power, through God's grace, by the power of the Holy Spirit, to apply the gospel to the human situation. And so we're going to look at two passages today to be able to grapple with um, how we are to do that, how we are to, to do that, and what's happening here. And the first is from the, the best activist, 
in, in, in all the Bible, the best activist, and you know who that is already. We've already intimated who that is. It's King Jesus, right? King Jesus is the best activist in the whole Bible. And so we're going to go to King Jesus, and we're going to see what he's got to say and uh, with respect to uh, the kind of situation that we are in, what the situation we're in right now, and what's happening. So we're going to look first at Matthew chapter 23, Matthew 23, verses 27 to 39. Matthew chapter 23, verses 27 to 39. And you might look at that and say, that's a little bit chunky of a passage. We're, we're going to get the context, and then we're going to whittle it down a little bit and get, get kind of a tight lens as opposed to a wide angle lens. So hang, hang in there. We're cool. All right. Matthew chapter 23, verses 27 through 39. And I'm reading from the New International Version of the Scriptures. And they read as follows. Jesus, uh, is, it, we're catching him in the middle of a prophetic denunciation of the religious leaders of his time, right? And so we, we're, not, we're not engaging the, the entire bit of that denunciation, which is brutal and it is incendiary, but we are, we're catching him right in the middle. So here we go. This is Matthew uh, 23, 27 to 39. Jesus says this. He says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You're like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead, and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside, you're full of hypocrisy and wickedness. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You build tombs for the prophets and decorate the graves of the righteous. And you say, if we'd only lived in the days of our ancestors, we would not have taken part with them in shedding the, the, of the blood of the prophets. So you testify against yourself that you are the descendants of those who murdered the prophets. Go ahead then and complete what your ancestors have started. You snakes, you brood of vipers, how will you escape being condemned to hell? Therefore, I am sending to you prophets and sages and teachers. Some of them will, you will kill and crucify. Others you will flog in your synagogues and pursue from town to town. And so upon you will come all of the righteous blood that has been shed on earth from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Truly, I tell you, all this will come on this generation. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who killed the prophets and stoned those sent to you, how often I've longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings and you will not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, this is brutal. And, and this is only like half of it. Okay, so this is only half of it. I want you to focus on, on, on a piece of this that, that, you, that you should ask questions about. There's a part of this where you should, you should say, whoa, wait, what? You should. You shouldn't just read this and like go like, you know, eat some Cheerios or whatever it is you do after you read scripture in the morning or afternoon or evening. You should stop and you should ask some questions. It's, it's right here. This is what Jesus says. He says in verse 35, and so upon you will come all the righteous blood that has been shed on earth from the blood of the righteous Abel, to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar, truly I tell you, all will come on this gen all this will come on this generation. And you should say, time out. You should. You should say, well, okay. I know Pharisees are bad, or, or at least it doesn't seem like they were all uniformly terrible, but as a group coming against Jesus, you know, they, they had issues. Um, and, and, and this is also teachers of the law as well. These are people who, who oppose Jesus. And he's saying, you're in serious trouble. You, you are courting hell, eternal damnation because of what you're doing. And this is, this is bizarre what he says. I mean, it, so you, you track with him for a while. He's basically accusing them of rank hypocrisy, right? And then he, he basically says that they're going to be responsible for all the blood spilled from Abel, and that's going way back. I mean, that's like the fourth person on the planet, okay? That's pretty far back. Abel, 
to Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, one of the last prophets in the Old Testament. And then he says, whom you, you murdered between the temple and the altar. Truly, I tell you, all this will come in this generation. And you should say, wait, why? The, the, the Pharisees and Sadducees, scribes, all these, all these religious leaders came out against Jesus. They weren't around then. They didn't do this stuff. They, they weren't around. I mean, chronologically speaking, they, they literally were not around. They weren't born. I mean, there are, there are centuries between, even when the last guy he mentions, Ze Zechariah, son of Berechiah, there are centuries between Zechariah and even when, they're even when the Pharisee movement got formed. Right? And you might look at that and say, okay, I, I know these guys are bad. I believe Jesus. Jesus is Jesus. But you, you say, what? how does that work? How does it work? Why is Jesus holding people, his contemporaries, responsible for what people did literally a great number of generations ago since, Ze since Zechariah? Not to mention Abel, who is just, you know, I, I can't even count the number of generations going back that far. How does Jesus hold these people responsible for this? I mean, aren't we told in the Bible that, hey, you suffer for your own sins? You know, it's not like, you know, if my mom sinned, that, you know, God just says, oh, sorry, kid, bad genetics, right? It, it doesn't quite work that way, right? What's happening here? Here's what's happening. Jesus is saying, look, if you continue in the sins of people who came before you on the day of judgment, you're lumped in with them. It's that simple. If you continue in their sins, you're lumped in. That, that's it. And Jesus is saying, you're going to do this. He says you're going to do this, because why? He, you go back a little bit, verse 33, you snakes, you brood of vipers, how will you escape being condemned to hell? Therefore, I am sending you, who? Prophets and sages and teachers. Sending, I am sending you, prophets, sages, teachers, teachers, excuse me, some of whom you will kill and crucify, others of whom you will flog in your synagogues and pursue from town to town. He's saying, all the people I'm going to send you, and that includes some of the apostles, or all the apostles, actually, and, and, and everybody he sends, right, everybody he sends out, he's like, to the extent that you persecute them and even kill them, because they are in line with all the Old Testament prophets, if you kill them, you're right in line with your forefathers who killed the Old Testament prophets. You perpetuated their sin. You're on the hook. See, that's, that's how generational sin works. That's how a sin wound gets perpetuated and goes institutional. That's how sin gets institutionalized. That's how racism gets institutionalized. That's how it happens. That's how it happens. And it's scary. Because what it means is this. Because a lot of us say, oh, I, hey, that, I wouldn't do that Ku Klux Klan stuff. And I believe you. I, most people are not Klansmen. You know that? Most people aren't Nazis. Most people on planet Earth are not that. It's not possible. That would be, the world would be unsustainable if, if most people were that. If most people were uh, Ku Klux Klansmen or Nazis or skinheads or, 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 or the, uh, the kind of racists who would hunt down a guy as he's jogging and shoot him. I've seen that recently. Right? Most people aren't that. But here's the funny thing. You don't have to be that. You don't have to be that. All you got to do is perpetuate that. You can perpetuate the impact. See? Institutions get infected. And they don't always look like uh, what began the original infection. But the trick is they don't have to. So it makes it tough to track this stuff, doesn't it? If you want to get at the root of the infection, you're like, well, man, this thing's shifty, right? Because basically, you don't have to look like the original infection. You don't have to look like the Ku Klux Klan. You don't have to look like a neo-Nazi. All you got to do is perpetuate it. All you got to do is perpetuate it. Right? And the stakes are high because look what Jesus says in verse 37. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I've longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings and you were not willing. Notice... He speaks to, he turns his attention to Jerusalem. He's speaking about and to Pharisees, teachers of the law, 
And then he shifts it to a big old macro thing, Jerusalem, right? The crown jewel of, 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 of Judean geography, of Jewish geography, right? This is God's place, the place where God said, this is where I will put my name. And now he speaks to Jerusalem, he's saying, you've inf- you, what you've done has become systemic. And he's telling them, basically, and you read the Gospels closely, you see this. Jesus is telling the Pharisees a lot of times, yeah, he's warning, there's a warning about hell. There's here, right here, it's, there's hell mentioned, no, no doubt, right? And that's eternal. And, and there's warning about e- eternal judgment for a lot of the, the religious rulers who oppose Jesus. But there's also another kind of warning he gives them continually. And it's a warning about the destruction of Jerusalem. And he's saying, you can't keep this. You can't keep this and defy God. And God has sent me. And to the extent that you reject me is the extent to which you reject God. And there, you can't have Jerusalem because it's now infected with your sin wound. Right? And that's what racism and other sins, by the way, not just racism does to institutions, a nation, cities, right? And Jesus is saying, I, 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 I longed, I longed to, to deflect that judgment from you, right? How often I longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate. And that, that happened in 70 A.D., a few decades after Jesus' resurrection, after he ascended to heaven. What happened? The Romans destroyed Jerusalem, and it's never, the temple's never been rebuilt to this day. To this day, centuries, almost 2,000 years later, almost 2,000 years, not rebuilt. And I think that if we want to talk about what the stakes are for the church's action with respect to America and racism and other sins, by the way, America, it's not just racism. This is just the one we're talking about now. If we want to stem the tide, one thing we need to figure out, we, we, shoot, we shoot for stuff like, you know, we want racism to never exist again. Laudable, but uh, I think that we're going to have to wait for Jesus to come back for that. Uh, let's shoot for our nation to not be destroyed from within. From within. I think that's a more reasonable goal. Still big, it's a big ticket item, but if you want to shoot for something more reasonable than just no racism ever, right? Um, shoot for our nation to not be destroyed by our sin wound. And with that, we turn to another passage. A passage that does not mention race explicitly at all, actually. Uh, it, it does not, but I think it may be instructive for us as to how we can be God's activists as we seek to apply the gospel to our particular uh, life situation as we court national disaster we're going to turn to first Peter chapter 1 verses 13 through 21 first Peter chapter 1 verses 13 through 21 admittedly there is not I don't, I don't know if you I, I haven't found anything particularly about race or racism here but I think that this is still instructive for us as we begin to figure out the church's role in uh, applying the gospel to the, our desperate situation here as we court national disaster. I'll read it very quickly. This is also from the NIV. 1 Peter 1, 13 through 21. Peter says this, and he's writing to a church that is suffering. He's writing to a suffering church. By the way, if you want to see where America's going right now, overall as a nation, even beyond the issue of racism, church, wake up. 1 Peter is going to be increasingly relevant for us. Get, get acquainted with 1 Peter. It's coming at us. 1 Peter 1, 13 through 21, NIV. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance, but... Just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it's written, be holy because I'm holy. Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. For you know that it's not with 
with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish, blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him, and so your faith and hope are in God. Now you might look at this rightly and say, what in the world does this have to do with being an activist for God and dealing with our particular life situation and deal with a nation that is courting disaster because we have a, a, a gaping sin wound? Okay, well let's get to that quickly. There's a few things in here that Peter says that I think are relevant for us. You could go to lots of other passages in Scripture. Like, this is not the silver bullet. But this is the one that, that, that I landed on. Okay. This is, this is where I landed, and I hope that it's relevant for you as well. Uh, Peter here, the churches are suffering, or the church to which he's writing is suffering. A great persecution. You read the whole letter, it's very easy to figure out. And he's trying to encourage them. And it's interesting that the first thing he tells them is that they are to have their, their minds alert and fully sober <laughs> because people who are suffering can't think you, you, it's tough to think when you're suffering I, I couldn't imagine for instance in, in, the, in the deep south people who, who you know love Jesus black people loving Jesus going to church how tough it must have been to focus on Christ as you know that at any point in time you could you know say the wrong thing to the wrong person and, uh, and things would not go for, too well for you. And maybe you would not make it home that night. And maybe no one ever would see you again. I don't know what that's like. What's it like for a slave who, who, who believes in Jesus or who believed in Jesus and would have to keep them, their mind fully alert and sober to focus on Christ as a slave to uh, masters in this country? I don't know what that's like. What's it like for a suffering church to have to do that? And it's interesting that Peter says, basically, get your mind right. He says here in ver verse 13, Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. And here, what Peter's encouraging these suffering Christians to do is to remember their future. And it's funny, right? Remember the future. You think about remembering the past, usually. But he's saying, remember the future. Remember the future. Keep your mind on it and be sober about it. Be sober. Keep your hope set on it. Your mind and your hope set on it soberly. Remember the future. Remember the future. Why is that important? Because as we begin being activists for God and dealing with racism and dealing with maybe a bunch of other ills, let us remember that the future for people who know Christ is glorious. The future for creation itself is glorious. And this is good because this helps us to not devolve into cynicism. It's so easy to be cynical. It's quite easy to be cynical right now. It's easy to, to be depressed there. I've, 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 I talk to people, I see people in my own social media platform, and I've talked to people who are just crushed by everything that they're seeing, you know, and how they're seeing things unfold the chaos, or some people are just saying, I can't believe that we're here again, yet again with the issue of race, with all the progress we've made, why can't we go, right? Cynicism is so easy to slip into. Hopelessness, nihilism is so easy to slip into. That's a lot of what we're seeing right now with some of the chaos in the, the shadow side of some of the protests. Nihilism is easy right now. That's easy stuff. Hope is hard. Nihilism is easy especially when things are not as they ought to be, especially when the social contract has been broken and authority figures are not doing what they ought to do. It's easy. And Peter says here, remember the future. And not just a great ideology, you know, pick an ideology and say, you know, which one are we going to, we, we need a better one, we need Marxism. That's reared its head now. For some people, that's the best future is Marxism. And I'd say, if you're, gonna, if you're gonna go that route, you better get a quick grasp of the past. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. And there are many people trying to apply that to the sin wound that we have. It will not work. It will not work. It doesn't work. People die. You can vote your way into it, but you gotta shoot your way out. 
people die. It won't work. Anarchy won't work. It won't work. Right? Remember the future. The future's glory is Jesus coming back. Now, that does not mean do nothing. Some people say, Jesus is coming back. He'll hammer this whole thing out. Yeah, just sit back, do nothing. Yeah, uh. Right? That's goofy. That's called being ridiculous. Don't, don't be that Christian. Please don't. That's dumb. Um, we are to do stuff as a result of the fact that Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back encourages us to be active for him, activated by him, and to know that the good we do, despite all the, the crud that surrounds us in the world, despite racism and every other ism around us in the world, that that good goes into eternity, even if it's trampled temporarily. Remember the future. Remember the future. Nothing you do for the Lord is lost. The justice you fight for, the racial justice you fight for, for the Lord and done his way, by the way, it's not lost. Even if no one hears you, it's not lost. It goes right on into eternity if you're tethered to Christ. If you've placed your faith in Christ, if your sins have been forgiven by Christ, if he's your resurrected hope. If that's true, remember the future. Remember the future, it's glorious. Next, we're told this in verse 14, as obedient children do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do, for it is written, be holy, because I am holy. See that? Be holy, because I am holy. That's Peter saying here. He's saying here, remember your father. Remember your father. He is the ch obedient children, right? And then he goes back to the Old Testament. Actually, he's going back to Leviticus. It's a kind of a constant refrain in, Levi in Leviticus, which is concerned with holiness. Holiness is just set up, being set apart, being set apart, being kind of cut out from the world and then brought, being uh, separated to God, separated from the world to God. There's a from and a to with holiness. And he's quoting Leviticus here, and he says, be holy, because I am holy, right? You obedient children, be holy because I am holy. And here, he, the, the picture he's painting is that God is our Father, and we're to be His, belong to Him, and then be like Him. Be like Him. The, the command to be holy as I am holy, it's a command, but it's also an invitation. It's an invitation to be like God. God's saying, I invite you to be like me in the ways that I invite you to be like me. We're not invited to be like God in all ways. God's omnipotent. He's all-powerful. We're not invited to be all-powerful. He's omniscient. He knows everything. We're not invited to be omniscient and know everything, right? That's not how that works. He's uh, omnibenevolent. He's all good. We're, we, you know, we are invited to be all good, you know, and we will get there one day. But here there's an invitation. Be holy because I am holy. Be like me. Be like me, he says. Right? Be separate. Be like me. And as we go, and you could rightly say, you could rightly say, God liberated the oppressed and called for the liberation of the oppressed, so I should too. And that's right. That's actually part of holiness. John Wesley saw this. John Wesley, and they, they were sadly in, in evangelicalism, we have people who were wonderful and preached awesome sermons and led gobs and gobs of people to Jesus and yet had slaves and even thought it was a great institution. If you want to see a great contrast, look at uh, George Whitfield, John Wesley. George Whitfield, one of the greatest evangelists that the world's ever seen, won many people to Christ, but yet supported the institution of slavery and thought that it was a God-given institution. Why? Because he was wrong and stupid. That's it. I, I want to. I know he got all kinds of street cred. It, it, it's lots to learn from him, but he was really, really wrong. John Wesley, a contemporary of Whitfield, right? Also, a great evangelist, one of the great greatest church planners the world has ever seen, actually. And uh, and and many more things you can say about John Wesley. John Wesley thought that that the institution of slavery was, was godless. See that? Thought it was godless. 
one of those guys sought to be like, be holy as God was holy in some ways. The other guy sought to be holy as God is holy in all ways. John Wesley being the latter. See? And some people rightly have said, I've seen this in social media, even actually I think from non-Christians floating around like, yeah, you know, be like God. Liberate the oppressed. Yes! That's part of holiness. Remember your father and be like him. Be like him. As obedient children, don't conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance, including racism, but lots of other isms. Right? Instead, be like God. Be like God. Shed that and work for the opposite. Great. Remember your father. Remember your future. Remember your father. Next, remember who to fear. Remember who to fear. Verse 17. Since you call on a father, that's God, who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. Hmm. Look at that. Look at that. And you could translate that, that last bit, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. You could, you could translate that reverent fear or holy fear. You know? Holy people have holy fear. See that? And that, that bit might freak people out. It's like, why should I fear God? He's my father. Why do I fear him? What do you do with that? Right? What do you do with that? Because God's the judge. And that's important to remember right now as we're talking about activists, being activists. Remember your future. Remember your father. And remember who to fear. Why? Because he's the judge. There's a lot of judgment going on right now. Lots and lots and lots of judging. A lot of judging. We're tearing down monuments. Boy, we're going to judge. Some of that's actually right. Stuff put up by the Daughters of the Confederacy, eh, that's propaganda. That was post-Civil War propaganda. I think there's a better way to go about tearing stuff down. Uh, there's, there's, a, there's legal ways to do that. But I, I, I get it. I understand. As a black man growing up in the South, I, I get it. I had to look at the statues of Robert E. Lee and Jefferson Davis and go, what's up with that? That doesn't make any sense. I know my history. That's crazy. That's craptacular. I get it. I understand. Right? There's a lot of judging going on right now. Uh, there are people who are being judged because they're not woke enough. It's not just about being woke. you got to be like extra crispy woke. you got to get all the right words. you got to say everything the right way. And if you don't, cancel culture kicks in. They'll eat you. They'll fire you. they get you fired. See that? There's a lot of judging going on right now. See, as we're, if we're going to be holy as God is holy and liberate the oppressed, yeah, who doesn't like that? All right? In, in, a, in, a, in a culture where victimization is actually social and political capital. We like this. Okay. But just remember who to fear because you get judged too. It might be a need for some grace as we're judging. Racism is a sin like any other sin. You know that? And I know that I've sinned against the Lord, and not just as a non-Christian. I've been a Christian for, for now, holy cow, how long has it been? I've been a Christian now for a long time, almost 30 years. And uh, I've sinned as, as a Christian, and I, I definitely you know, felt the judgment of God on me in different instances for that, and had to repent. And, but always I've received grace. And have had to repent in light of it, but I, I've, I've received grace. Do we really want a culture where we are going to be activa activated by God to deal with racism and any other isms and not be giving grace as we're making all these moral judgments? Because guess what? Remember who you fear. We all get judged at the end. There's a day of judgment coming and everybody gets judged and it's the final day. And there are only two options, it's heaven and hell. And we're told in scripture, you know, with the judgment with which we are judged, that's what we're going to get. People say, what do we want? Justice. When do we want it now? I had a pastor who used to say this. I used to go to a small inner city church in New Orleans years ago. And I had a pastor who used to, he used to say, and he, as 
out and proud, and, you know, activist as, as anybody, but he'd say, people say, what do you want, justice? When do we want it now? He said, eh. He said, I say, what do we want? Mercy. When do we want it? He's like, I want it all the time. I want as much as I can get. We can do this activist thing, but boy, we better be bringing some mercy with us, and that's not happening a lot right now. We're treating racism like it's, it's, it's the worst sin on the planet. Is it terrible? Yeah. But guess what? We also kill babies on a regular basis through abortion. That's also evil. Shocker. Right? We're also a, a, a culture that, that revels in every form of sexual immorality you could ever imagine. That's also terrible. Yeah. There's a lot of us who are very selective in our activism. And there's a lot of Christians, I fear, right now who've become really selective. Boy, they are, without mercy, pounding the, pounding the pulpits. Their Facebook platform pulpits, their Twitter platform pulpits against racism. Ha ha! It's like, okay. Okay. But just remember that the same Jesus is going to apply that same judgment to all those other sins that, that are acceptable that nobody's talking about that are in our lives. Be careful. Remember your future, remember your father, remember who to fear. Next, remember your freedom. This is the last one. Remember your freedom. Verse 18. For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors. But with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect, he was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him, and so your faith and hope are in God. What a great little synopsis of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news. Remember your freedom, remember your future, remember your father, remember who, you, who to fear, and remember your freedom. Remember your freedom. Free from what, you might say. The word freedom actually is not, not explicitly mentioned in this passage. But look at what he says here. He says, look, you, speaking to us who, who follow Jesus, you were, you were redeemed. It wasn't with precious things that you were redeemed. Or redeemed just means bought. It's really a commercial term. It means bought. It wasn't with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were, that with which you were bought. And, and bought from what? Redeemed from what? The empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors. See that? Racism and all the other isms. It's handed down to us. You know, we don't just become that way. It gets in our bones from somewhere. Handed down to us from our ancestors. He's saying, you, you, when you, you were bought from that, from that empty way. With, you know, from that empty way of life that was passed on to you. You were bought, but you weren't bought with, with perishable things. And look at what he said, with silver or gold. I mean, back then and even right now, those are pretty precious jewels, right? The whole economies measured by those standards in the ancient world and even in our world. But he's saying, but no, there's something more valuable, the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or, or defect. What's his qualifications? He was chosen before the creation of the world, revealed in these last times for our sake. He's the vehicle through which we believe in God, who, who raised him from the dead, glorified him. And makes it so that our faith and hope are in God. You see that? Our freedom is that we're purchased from the empty way of life handed down to us from our ancestors. That's important to remember if we're going to be activated for God. Why? Because, well, number one is that we, we are free. Through Christ we can be free to not live in, in racism handed down to us. We can be free to not live the way in which our ancestors live. I, I, it, I've been very impressed recently by, by some Christians, one of whom I actually know who's politically active. And, uh, and, and these are people who were, are politically conservative, who recently in Mississippi, and they live in Mississippi, and they've said, you know, it's time, to, we gotta take the Confederate flag down. It, it's time. And, and, the, and the arguments are beautiful. The arguments are, look, this is, we literally had a, 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 a rebel faction within, the, within our nation, within our republic, that seceded from our republic and waged war within our country. We can't celebrate that. 
And also, we can't celebrate something that explicitly, explicitly endorses racism. Okay? And I've, I've been so impressed with that. They, they, they're saying, we got to, as Christians, they're saying, we have to shed the empty way that was handed down to us by our ancestors. We got to shed that. Right? We have to shed that. And I've been highly impressed with, with these, these men who've come out and said that, and, they, and they, they're, they're, they're taking heat. They're taking heat. But they're, they're doing it. They're doing it. And they're looking to go to the legislature. They're not just burning stuff, right? But they're, they're taking heat for it. Let's see that. They're free. They're free from the empty way handed down to them. We're free if we're bought by, by the blood of Christ. Others have to just go be in the flow. They're trapped in the flow of history. You know, people are talking, we talk a lot these days, don't be on the wrong side of history. That, 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 there's merit to that. There's merit to that sentiment. I understand where it comes from. But I, I'll say this, whoever's on the right side of eternity is always on the right side of history. Right? Whoever's on the right side of eternity is always on the right side of history. And whoever's on the wrong side of eternity is always in some way going to be on the wrong side of history. You might get some, other, some things right, but there's some things you're going to drastically get wrong. And the, the Christian who's activated by God and who has been redeemed by the precious blood of Christ through the power of the gospel is free to be on the right side of history. You, you may not get there all in one shot, don't get me wrong. You, know, you don't like to become a Christian. It's like, woo, I know everything. No, that doesn't happen. You wish that might happen. It doesn't happen. But you're free you're free to not be caught up in just the flow of history, right? To not be caught up in the flow of the sins of history, the sin wounds of history, right? Whereas others might get some things right, might be able to detach themselves from some things, but are lost in the overall system, the big system, the big systemic sin of just humanity's rage against God. Might get some things right, but we're always going to get some, something wrong. The one who's on the right side of eternity through the blood of Christ is always on the right side of history. So, ultimately. Ultimately. Right? Remember your future. Remember your father. Remember your fear. Remember your freedom. Right? Remember all these things. Be alert and sober. Many are acting and feeling without thinking. And it's really easy for Christians to do that right now because we're not in church. Politics has been the new religion for a long time. And even more so now because so many of us, because of the coronavirus, are not in church. E even those of us who are with credibility, we, we're, we're online, we're, we're doing what we're doing right now, right? And with credibility and everything, you know, don't get me wrong. I'm doing the same thing you're doing. But how susceptible are we to be caught in the flow, in the river of emotion and, 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 and all kinds of activity without sobriety and without thinking? How susceptible are we with, to that right now? Because we're not embodied staring at each other, being accountable before one another, all of us before a holy God. It's a scary moment. Remember your future, church. Remember your father. Remember your fear. Remember who to fear. And remember your freedom in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And with armed with all those things, be activated against racism, against every evil form of ism that's out there that exalts itself against the living God. But this is our moment and the stakes are very high because it, it's this or the dissolution of our union, of our nation. It's this or bust. The stakes are high. Remember who you are. Amen.